All right, we're going to cover two Japanese artworks. This one is Night Attack on the Sanjo Palace. And this is in Japan, 1250 to 1300. And this is a hand scroll, which is ink and color on paper. I don't think you need to know the period, but if you'd like to write it down, go for it. All right, so what we're looking at here, College Board gives us two images. The one on the top is the whole scroll that is rolled out. And then on the left, you're looking at this piece that is the end of the scroll. And so the College Board wants us to be able to identify that image as well. So for form, this is a continuous narrative that reads from right to left. So remember, continuous narrative has probably um, a figure. I think it's going to be the emperor, the retired emperor in this cart or in this cage or carriage. And this is gonna be repeated throughout. So since it's repeated throughout with no barriers, it's a continuous narrative. This is a 23 foot long scroll that would be rolled up and then unrolled as you view it. All right, context, what's happening at the time. This reflects the beginning of Shogun rule and the samurais in Japan. You don't need to know the year, but we're going to compare it to some other years. That's why I have it on there. Uh, this is military warlords holding the power. And we're going to see this reflected in art and literature at this time. It's going to shift and start to emphasize the honor and the bravery of the warrior. We're also seeing this at Todaiji when we looked at those neo guardian figures. Here's a close up of their fierce expressions on their face. So that's why I had the year up. So 1185 is when the samurais have control. Neo-Guardian figures are made in 1203, and then the night attack of Sanjo Palace is 1250. So you can see those ideas being reflected in the art at that time. All right, back to Todaiji. So Todaiji was created or was made in the capital, and that's where it is now, but Nara is no longer the capital. So at the time when Todaiji was made, it was made during the Nara period, which was also the cap capital. And so that earlier Japanese work is really influenced by what they're having, what they're seeing in China. Um, so then the imperial or the royal family, they move from Nara to Kyoto. It's not that far. I looked it up about 40 minutes. And then the new royal court in Kyoto develops a distinctive Japanese style called Yamato-e, which means Japanese painting. All right, here's the scroll. And we're going to go from right to left. So you kind of have singular figures and then a carriage, and then it starts to go into this mass crowd of people and they are storming the palace in the middle of the night, about 2 a.m. And then here's where you have the retired emperor. It's been described as a cage or a cart. Then you have them in the palace and the palace is burning, more chaos. There's supposed to be bodies down below. These are women fleeing up here in their long robes. And then as you move out to the left, you see the carriage repeated. And then again, we end with singular people, samurai, warriors. And the era was almost interacting with the text. All right, so overall, this is depicting war and violence, right? In a really chaotic way. This is more specific. So it's samurai warriors in a surprise night attack, setting fire to the palace and capturing the retired emperor in a cage who is shown throughout. This is also depicting a historical event. This happened about a hundred years before this scroll was made. And it's a feud between two family clans. All right, and we're going to watch this video. This video is from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where I believe you can see the scroll today. From the Sancho Palace, these scrolls uh, relate almost 100 years later events that happened in the 12th century. It is probably one of the most powerful battle scenes you could imagine anywhere. And for me, talking about them is a really emotional experience because it really describes the horrors of war in a very vivid way. You read a hand scroll from right to left. Typically, you would be holding an expanse, just what you can hold right in front of you between your two hands, and you as the viewer are controlling it. And the activity starts rushing from the right-hand side 
to the left-hand side of the scroll. But the chaos of it, you get because they're layering these figures one on top of the another. You get the whirring of the wheels and people being caught up in those whirls, the spokes as it goes by. You see that motion in it. And then you have these countervailing forces where people are coming from the left. And so he structures this event, which is capturing the abduction of the retired emperor and his younger sister by these upstart military warriors. They lead him out of the palace, which you will eventually see at the other end of the scroll. But in the process, they set the palace on fire. The women of the palace, who wear these incredibly heavy robes, are trying to flee. They don't want to be raped. So they jump into the well and they suffocate each other. It's a great contrast between the aristocrats who are done with these very fine features, almost no expression on their faces, and then these upstart warriors who are animals and they're given animal-like faces. And you see them cutting other people's heads off. There is a very conscious attempt to know what you need to see and what is the focal point and how to, in these crowd scenes, where to create these tensions. And um, I, I don't think there's any other work of art like it. あの、あの、I saw the scroll in 9-11, just happened to have a group of people there, and it's an unforgettable experience for me. But every time I show this scroll, you know, people see in that tragedy things that they've experienced themselves. Here's a few details of the night attack on Sanjo Palace. So this style of painting, Yamato-e, appealed to Japan's military leaders. Um, they're also giving a bird's eye view, you can also call it an aerial view of the palace. The roof has been removed so we can actually see the chaos that's happening inside. The, there's no real meditative, introspective landscape for us to calmly look at, right? This is very different from earlier Chinese painting like Fan Quan's Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. So this is really different in that it's packed with action. And then where the artist is giving the most attention, they're not modeling or giving um, volume or mass or shading, right? They're really focusing on the use of line with using all those contour lines. I would call this a weighted contour line in my art class, going from thin to thick, right, with the contour lines. But they're also giving a lot of attention to the armor and the weapons, more so than other parts of the figures. One more detail, love the little splatter of blood coming up here. And then the fire, right? This really stylized depiction of this swirling fire with splatters on it as well. Splatters of ink and paint. All right, so what artworks can we compare this to? Um, we talked in class about Hugh Neffer and this being a continuous narrative. A big difference would be that the, um, the Hugh Neffer piece, the scroll, is depicting beliefs of the afterlife as opposed to a historical event. And then Trajan's column, right? That's a very long continuous narrative that is spiraling up this column. That's a relief carved out of marble. Definitely the Bayou Tapestry. This one is really easy to compare it to. We even have a little decapitated guy down here. So a refresher on Bayou Tapestry that is Romanesque. It's an embroidery, it depicts the Battle of Hastings, the William and the main character is William the Conqueror, and he is being repeated all throughout, making this a continuous narrative. It's depicting a historical battle, and it's 230 feet long. All right, next artwork is White and Red Plum Blossoms by Ogata Corin. 1710 to 1716, so we're about 500-ish years later, still Japanese art. This is ink, watercolor, and gold leaf on paper, but this is actually a screen. Uh, the materials say it's on paper though. So this is painted on a pair of two panel folding screens. 
I don't think we need to know the size, but I just thought it's kind of good to see how large this is. And the content and form, the meaning and what it's depicting is really similar. So there's a stream in the center that is narrowing in the distance. That's a really easy way to show depth and perspective. So artists show going back into space in different ways. And I think the easiest way is things getting smaller as they go back in the distance. All right, there are stylized curls that's on the stream. So here's a picture that's been really brightened and that's reflecting or representing a swirling current, kind of the movement in the water by creating that pattern of swirls. The way the artist is doing this is a technique where they're dipping wet ink or paint into this layer of wet paint. So that's what happens when you're when it's being dipped in there, kind of swirls out. He's doing the same technique on the trees. It also reminds me, if you think of Wangechi Mutu's praying mantra and the way the, the modeled skin looks on the female figure, I think has a similar effect. Context, this would have appealed to luxurious tastes of the aristocracy. And then I guess function, this was made for a feudal lord to be in their house. You can easily relate this to the screen, the screen with siege of Belgrade and hunting scene. Also, as far as what we're looking at, it's very chaotic, it looks like battle, right? The siege of Belgrade. So this would you can easily relate that back to the night attack in San Joe Palace. All right, so this, you don't need to write this down in your notes. This is for the screen with siege of Belgrade and a hunting scene we haven't talked about in a while, but this screen was inspired by Japanese folding screens. And this is called a biombo, it's a folding screen in Spanish. This is when the new world is looking to Japan for inspiration. There's a lot of goods being brought in and traded, including lacquerware boxes, ivory goods, and folding screens. And this would have been placed in Viceroy's palace in Mexico. So again, for the aristocracy, the upper class, the wealthy, the powerful. All right, back to what we're seeing being depicted. You have the stream and then on either side, so flanking the stream are two plum trees. On the right, you have one with red blossoms, and this one's being described as being more youthful. And on the left, you have one with white blossoms, and that one I have read as being described as older. And then in the background is gold. Definitely need to mention that there's use of gold leaf that is on the paper. And we're gonna see gold leaf again when we talk about Gustav Klimt, when we cover unit four. And then Gustav Klimt is really inspired by Byzantine, that guy. All right, but in common, these both have the use of gold leaf, therefore creating these shallow spaces with the gold leaf. They're also both combining abstract, right? All the um, patterns and swirls and gold along with something representational. So in Gustav Klimt, the way he is painting figures on the kiss and on this artwork, it's really realistic with the depiction of the facial features and the skin tone, and then abstract with the backgrounds, the patterns, the shapes, the colors. Same thing here. I think these trees are pretty representational. That's what they would look like. And then abstract the depiction of the stream, the background. All right, if you Google the term Rinpa school, um, you can write down Rinpa school or Rinpa painting style, but this is an example of what comes up. So if, what is the Rinpa school? What are the characteristics? What do these all have in common? Right, really simple. It's very much nature-based, all using this gold leaf. All right, so the word Rin comes from our man Ogata Korin, from his name, and then Pa means school. So when you think of school here, it's not a school you would go to to learn how to paint like Corin. It's more of a following. Think of a group of fish following along in a school. So it's a group of artists that are all painting in this similar way. All right, this I got from the Metropolitan Museum of Art website. It says Rinpa is a bit of a min misnomer in that the term identifies artists who worked in a particular style, sometimes together, but did not form an organized or hereditary school. Although Rinpa traces its origins to original artists, it derives its name from Ogata Korin. Korin and his brother were members of a Kyoto family of textile merchants that serve, serviced samurai, 
a few nobility and city dwellers. Distantly related to those original artists, the Ogata family owned a number of objects made by the original artists, which Corinne studied carefully. So it's talking about how he's inspired by other artists and he's working with textiles and creating prints to go on textiles. So working in vivid colors or ink monochrome, here's an example of monochrome, one tone, often on gold ground, the prolific and versatile artist developed a painting style that was more abstracted and simplified than the compositions of those original artists, his predecessors. Corinne used his decorative and bold designs not only to ornament or decorate paintings, but also for textiles, lacquerwares, and ceramics. All right, so we should be able to compare these two artworks together. There's a really big gap in between these. Fan Quan, this is a Chinese example of painting. And then Ogata Corinne, this is a Japanese later example of painting, but really similar, um, reflecting the ideas of Shintoism and uh, nature. And then if you look at the tree, the jagged way the tree is depicted, you can also compare it to the jagged sharp harshness of the trees in Fan Quan's Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. Here's another example by Ogata Corin, just to have another view of his work. Very strong diagonal lines. All right, characteristics of the Rinpa school, distinctive brush techniques, vivid colors, bold abstract designs, definitely inspired by nature and flat gold backgrounds. Boom. 